Um, for my research, I looked at marina for clean-up initiatives and how participation in these kind of voluntary projects can influence volunteer behaviour. And I focused on projects working within Scotland. Um, so, a bit about marine litter. Um, it's now recognised as a global pollutant and it's been identified as one of the 11 indicators for good environmental status by European seas under the EU Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Um, and marine litter is defined as any solid manufactured material that can end up in the marine environment either accidentally or unintentionally. Um, and it has many environmental impacts that have now been recognised. So it can pose a threat to marine wildlife through entanglement, ingestion, um, and it also can undermine ecosystem integrity and functionality. But apart from these environmental impacts, there are also many social impacts that so can reduce the visual amenity of the beaches and can impact any um, economies that are based on coastal industry. Um, so things like fishing or tourism, coastal tourism industry. Um, but marine litter is fundamentally linked with our beh behaviours and there are many social roots and causes. So these are um, many pictures that I've taken around the coast of Scotland during my research um, just to demonstrate the different kinds of marine litter, so it can literally be anything. <laughs> um, so as part of my research I identified three main behaviours that influence the amount of litter in the marine environment. So I called them marine litter behaviours or MLB. Um, and this was mainly focusing on littering behaviours, recycling, reuse and repurposing of items to reduce the amount of waste we produce, and also the consumption of non-biodegradable items, so things like plastics or other synthetic materials that take a really long time to degrade in the marine environment. And so for this, I focused on three different marine litter cleanup initiatives, I called them MLCI, within Scotland. And um, I defined marine litter cleanup initiatives as any kind of initiative or project that involved the public in the removal of litter on a voluntary basis. So the three projects I looked at were, first of all, Fishing for Litter, which is an initiative run by Chemo International, and it engages fishermen in the removal of litter. So fishermen are provided with these heavy-duty bags, they take them out on their boats with them, and any litter that they catch in their nets while they're fishing, they can put in the bags and dispose of free of charge on the shore when they return. I also looked at the Marine Conservation Society Beach Watch, which is a national beach litter monitoring and surveying program. Um, and it's in operation within the UK, and Cramond Beach, which is just along the coast, is one of their reference beaches for all um, national and European level monitoring. Um, and the other one I looked at was, it's called the Davil Red Up. It's a community-based initiative in Shetland, run by the Shetland Immunity Trust, and it runs in conjunction with their um, island-wide national, well, island-wide littering programme called Dunchuck Brook. And this is their little um, kind of, I guess, mascot they've just made. <laughs> made of little bits of litter. Um, so to do this, I did a kind of two-part analysis. I looked at the project side of things, so I had some interviews with different project organisers, and then I focused on the participant or volunteer side of things, and I did some semi-structured interviews with all the volunteers from all the three projects, and then I did some self-completed surveys with Beach Clean volunteers, so people who were involved in um, Marine Conservation Society Beach Watch or the Red Up, and I applied the same surveys to people who were just using the same beaches that were cleaned and the purpose of this was to understand whether there was any difference in just going to see the litter on the beach or being physically involved in a project that was taking part in that same beach. And so to guide my research, I looked at um, the different factors that can influence adoption of behaviours. And um, so I colour-coded my results. So the green bubbles represent factors that were really strongly influenced by participation in these projects, and the orange bubbles highlight areas that have a bit of room for improvement. So first of all, what was really important was awareness of the issue. So even though a lot of volunteers said that previously they were aware of the problem, being involved um, in the initiative and being physically in the environment really made them become aware of the actual extent of the problem, the nature of the problem, and what the main sources of the problem were. And many of them were surprised to understand that they were contributing to litter without realizing it. Um, so this influenced their willingness to act. They were much more willing to do something about it and to see it through. And they also became much more aware of different solutions they could take. So as well as removing litter from the environment, they were aware of other things they could be doing to prevent it. Um, so this self-efficacy was really important. So this, um, this reflects the individual's perception of their ability to do something about the problem. And this was really strongly linked with the different solutions they became aware of. So in some cases, self-efficacy was really strongly supported. But depending on the solution they became aware of and their understanding of the problem, um, this was more limited. And that also um, 
links to their perception of responsibility. <laughs> so who they thought should be in charge of dealing with the problem, which again linked to the awareness of solution in the problem. And similarly, it linked to different contextual factors, um, which could be practicality, so time or money to be able to do something about it, but also any infrastructural barriers. So to give you a really quick example, a lot of people became aware of the extent of plastic in the marine environment. And so they were willing to do something about it, and they were aware that a way to avoid this was to not purchase it. Um, but they felt they were unable to do something about it, and the responsibility to do something about it lay in the manufacturing companies who make products of plastic. And so they felt limited by the contextual barriers. So they didn't have time or money to search for alternatives, and they felt there weren't any alternatives. So it really in, like, highlights the, in, the importance of raising awareness of different, different solutions that can avoid these contextual barriers. Um, something else that's really important were the normative or social influences. So having people um, in a group environment and allowing them to see that others are also involved in these same projects and willing to do something about it was really beneficial to encourage them to keep doing something about it and to go back. And it allows them to establish a bit of a network and sort of, you know, a bit of moral support. <laughs> and the final thing was trial error and feedback. So getting involved in these projects allow people to sample anti-littering behaviour and a lot of the initiatives give feedback to the individuals so that they're able to see that their actions, that they might perceive as small actions, it just takes an hour or two, are able to actually cumul cumulati cumul cumulatively make a big difference. <laughs> so quickly going back to the behaviours, I found that littering was most easily influenced, most strongly influenced by participation, and this was mainly because people perceived it as something they could do a lot about, so it was seen as a personal waste management issue rather than something else that relied on someone else. Recycling, reuse and repurposing was more strongly influenced among some than others, but it was, kind of, it was not so strongly influenced because a lot of people felt they already did a lot about it, and um, to be able to do more, to recycle more or reuse things more, they felt that it was um, determining, it was reliant more on the infrastructure behind it. And the behaviour that was hardest to change with participation was the consumption of non-biodegradable materials because it was the behaviour that individuals felt most strongly relied on external support, so it was the responsibility of others or required extra infrastructure support. So a few conclusions. My research kind of highlighted the importance of engaging individuals in the marine environment so they're able to physically witness the types of litter and get involved in doing something about it. And these projects really provide an opportunity to engage the individuals but also empower them to do something about the problem and go beyond simply raising awareness but support the adoption of behaviours. And as marine litter is um, becoming something that we're increasingly um, recognising as a significant global problem and as we begin to try and address marine litter and to tackle it effectively, it's important to acknowledge and recognise the potential that these initiatives hold to really support um, behaviour change and also to tackle the problem but it's also really important that we recognise that these initiatives cannot work by themselves, so it's really important that they be supported by other initiatives and legislation and necessary infrastructure so that they're able to realise their full potential. And yeah, thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be around. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Emily. Um, we've got some time.